you know, I guess one thing we've learned today by listening to this, y'all have been great, uh, and the panels have been great, uh, thought-provoking, and they make us think about people that uh, have a hard time getting the house, have a hard time finding a place to live, and, uh, you know, we all care about those people, and we really do, and we, we figure with inflation, Happening, and I think the economists today said mortgage rates are going up. To this, you know, this little while ago, the guy from the Mortgage Bank Association said four percent next year. It's not going to get any easier, and the, the groceries people have to buy are not going to get any cheaper. So I think affordability is a key issue that we will all need to pay attention to, and in that regard. Nicole Bashow is here to talk to us on this housing affordability issue. This is our keynote for the day. And she's with an economist with Zillow, and she is a housing market expert who uses Zillow data to drive research and tell stories about housing that empower consumers, industry professionals, and policymakers to make informed decisions. Prior to Zillow, she consulted for Landesta in the Center for Women's Land Rights. And we're really happy to have Nicole here today to address our keynote speech on housing affordability crisis. Nicole. Thanks, Ralph. Um, so my name is Nicole. My pronouns are she, her. I'm an economist at Zillow. And today I'm going to be talking about housing affordability and giving you guys a sneak peek at our 2022 market predictions. We're going to be releasing those tomorrow so you guys get a little bit of an early access to that. A uh, quick outline of some of the topics I'm going to be hitting on are what are uh, the hot markets going to be for next year and how, what are housing prices going to be doing, how that's going to look different than it looked in 2021. I'll be talking about where and how buyers are looking for affordability. And then finally, I'll be talking about demand in the single family homes market, particularly for single family rentals. 2021 was really talked about as this year of breaking records in real estate. We had, if you look back at several of Zillow's market reports from this year, month after month, we were repeating ourselves saying, we've hit record uh, setting home price appreciation, record setting rent appreciation, et cetera. This graph here looks at, um, on the blue, we have our graph of home price growth, and the yellow is our graph of um, rent to price appreciation over the last couple of years. And we can see just really how quickly those things have picked up over the course of the pandemic and what we, that means when we're talking about a record. Uh, typical home price appreciation has been around 4% for the last 20 years. Rent price appreciation has been around 3% the past six years. And so these numbers are just really astronomically high and higher than anything we've ever seen before. We also have extremely low inventory, and that was a big story for 2021, and what was driving a lot of this price growth was just the fact that there was a huge lack of supply of homes. The blue line here is a longer look at home price appreciation, and the yellow is months of supply. And we can see in the beginning of 2020, when supply started to go down pretty significantly, that's when prices started to, to really pick up. Uh, we've seen somewhat of a return of supply over the past couple of months, but it has been nowhere near enough to keep up um, with the demand that we're seeing and really curb those prices. Um, we have, however, started to see this, this change um, in terms of monthly home price appreciation over the past couple of months where we're seeing things starting to taper back down towards a normal level. This graph here is monthly home price appreciation and we can see it's starting to come back down. We're going to start to see things returning to more of a normal level, um, but that's not going to happen really anytime soon. On the left-hand side of this, we have our, our home price forecasts. And, and one thing that we're, we're expecting is we're expecting 2022 to really be a year um, that is still really hot. We're going to have a really competitive market. It's going to be a seller's market. We're going to see home prices increasing a lot. Um, but it's not going to be quite at the level that we saw in 2021. Um, however, the first couple of months in 2022, um, which is that blue line on the, on the left, um, we're going to continue to see home price appreciation increasing. We're going to continue to break these records as we move closer and closer towards a 20% annual appreciation rate before that starts to come back down. Um, 
um, around the, the middle of next year. Um, and that's really going to put a lot more pressure on affordability. It's really going to be impacting, you know, a, a lot of these other issues that we've been talking about as home prices are going to continue to stay elevated. We're anticipating 2022 ending somewhere between, uh, you know, around 11% appreciation, um, which is still incredibly high. You know, I know a lot of other people and industry market um, experts are, are estimating much lower appreciation rates, but this is where we think the market is going to be. Um, and, and so far, our, our um, you know, look ahead has been pretty accurate for the past, you know, couple of months. So, you know, we really expect to see a strong market. We're also expecting to see strong sales levels in 2022. Uh, the market or the graph on the left here is looking at sales, and we're projecting those to stay elevated for, for the rest of the this year and into next. We're projecting that 2022 will be the second strongest year for home sales um, since 2006, right behind 2021. So all of this is to say that it's still going to be a really hot market. We're still going to see a lot of the same storylines that we've had this year um, in terms of what actually is happening um, with pricing and, and with housing. Another story that's not really going to be changing that much is the fact that the Sunbelt markets are really going to be in the spotlight throughout next year. This graph looks at uh, home price growth on a quarterly basis, and the darker the blue points are markets where we're going to see faster growth. And that's really throughout that Inland West and Sunbelt region, and that's going to continue throughout 2022. That was a big story this year, and that's not really going to change. What we are going to see change is that we're going to see this rise of secondary cities within the Sunbelt, places like Sarasota and Fort Myers and Raleigh and Daytona Beach are going to come to the top of the list when we're talking about places that are growing faster. We're looking at here um, at just a different look at quarterly price appreciation um, for both homes and for rentals. Um, and, and we can see that those places are really surpassing some of the 2021 superstars like Austin, Phoenix, Boise, and Tampa. These places that we've seen so much growth throughout this year are being overtaken by these secondary cities as the, the, the demand starts to spill over um, into some of these other areas within the region. One of the reasons why we're seeing um, a lot of this growth spilling over is because there is this affordability challenge that's hitting these 2021 superstar markets. This um, chart is looking at mortgage affordability, which is the share of income people spend on their mortgages. And, and that's really increasing a lot over the past couple of years. Um, and particularly in these markets, it's going to continue to increase throughout 2022. We have this threshold at 30% where when people spend more than 30% of their income on housing, we consider them to be housing burdened and a lot of things start happening you know on a household level people have less money left over to spend on groceries and utility bills and, and other obligations and on a housing market level we start see some things starting to break down um, when we have that affordability cross over that threshold we're expecting a lot of these markets to either be close to approaching or over that 30 percent mark um, as we come to 2022 um, and that's that's really one of the reasons why we're going to see a lot of that spillover effect right we have places like austin here's another look at it's just a different way to look at mortgage affordability. Um, and, and we have places like this where we've seen really, really fast home price growth really, really, uh, really quickly. And, and that's playing into this affordability picture because incomes aren't able to keep up. Home buyers in Austin are going to have a much more difficult time buying a house a year from now than they did in the past. Um, and places like Miami. Miami is currently the most unaffordable market outside of California. Austin is looking to surpass that in the next couple of months. And these affordability issues are really driving a lot of that that um, spill over into these secondary markets because people just can't afford to buy homes at these prices for very much longer. And that's really going to play into what the future of these 2021 superstars is going to look like. We can look at places like New York City that have had similar periods of exponential growth um, in the past and, and the affordability played such a, a role that, that the market turned. Austin and Phoenix and Boise are likely to face a similar challenge moving forward as prices are staying at you know this this unsustainably high level and rising so quickly on the left hand side of this graph we can see Manhattan's home price index between 2013 and 2018 Manhattan home prices grew really fast we saw a lot of bidding wars we saw a lot of demand a lot of the same things that we're seeing in other parts of the market now and then in 2018 buyers couldn't afford to buy the homes anymore um, and so we saw all this inventory this luxury inventory sitting on the market that nobody could afford and that caused prices to go down that's a really real risk that's facing places like 
like Phoenix and Boise and Austin and all of these really expensive markets that are facing these affordability challenges is that they might look like this in the coming years. So consumers are taking that information and then whether or not they have, they really understand, you know, what's happening on the market level, they're understanding on their budget level, you know, I can't afford the same house I could buy, you know, in Austin a couple of years ago. So maybe I'm going to start looking at some of these other more affordable places that still give me the lifestyle and amenities that I'm looking for. And so that's why we're going to see a lot of this growth in these secondary cities. We're not going to see everybody looking for affordability necessarily in the suburbs or in, uh, excuse me, in, in the Sun Belt though. You know, we are going to see people staying within their metro areas and really trying to find what affordability looks like for them there. Earlier this year, we looked at commute times um, and really this question of how remote work is impacting um, uh, commutes and, and where people are living as a result. And we saw in a lot of cities like Boston, these dense coastal expensive metros where we had really high home price growth further out from the center. So we can see here these rings are our commute times. Um, and so this is anywhere from a 10 to a 90 minute commute from, from the central business district there. Um, and, and the further out we go, the higher home price growth we saw, right? People were moving to the suburbs and the exurbs of these communities because that's where homes were most affordable. Um, and, and now they don't have to commute as much and so they can really detach themselves from, from being you know, within a proximal place to work. And we're going to continue to see some cities looking like this as we come into 2022. There will still be places where remote work and these different um, migration trends are leading the exurbs and the, you know, the suburbs and the exurbs to really be growing quickly. Um, there are also places that used to look like Boston that are going to be changing in 2022. Seattle, the, the commute time map looked exactly like Boston where we had you know, 60 to 90 minute commutes, seeing this huge price expansion. Um, but in recent months, we've started to see that change a little bit. So on the left hand side here, we have on a zip code level, our quarterly home price growth um, from last year. And then on the left hand side, it's from this year. And we can see that in Seattle, we had a lot of, of the, the highest growth kind of concentrated around the edges of the metro area, um, a lot, around a lot of these exurban communities. We come to this year and we see that price growth is starting to come, become more concentrated a little bit closer to the city. And we're seeing people really starting to, to reconsider what affordability is in a lot of these markets, right? In Seattle, we've seen a huge price explosion in the suburban and exurban communities, so much so that the affordability um, kind of balance has shifted. It used to be a a lot cheaper for me to live far away from the city and even though I was far away from the city it you know it was really affordable and cheap for me to do so now I just pay a little bit more to live closer to a lot of the amenities and services that I'm looking for. And that affordability matrix has kind of changed for a lot of households. And we're seeing that show up in where we're seeing the demand in these markets. So we're going to see places where, you know, we're going to have a lot more growth kind of coming back towards the city centers and towards these urban cores as we go into 2022. We had markets that looked completely different than all of that throughout the Midwest. Um, you know, we have affordability in places like Detroit and Indianapolis and Kansas City that's really concentrated in the urban centers centers where we have, you know, historically depressed urban areas and we're seeing this urban revival as people are searching for affordability and finding it in these areas. We have some sprawling Sunbelt metros like Atlanta where that don't have any pockets of affordability and we're seeing growth being more widespread throughout the metro area. And all of this is to really say that 2022 is going to bring about a much more heterogeneous housing market than we saw this year. You know, a lot of the stories we put out this year were, you know, here's, you know, here's something that's happening and here's 50 markets that it's happening and take your pick of which one you think is interesting. But it was the same storyline. When we come into 2022, we're going to have a lot more regional and local variations and a lot more regional and local stories that we'll be able to tell out of that. So that's definitely something to look forward to um, as, we, as we look at what stories are going to be shaping um, the 2022 housing market. Another thing that is both staying the same and also changing from 2021 is remote work, right? You know, remote work and hybrid work are going to be influencing places, like I said, like Boston, where we're going to have people, you know, detaching from these um, urban areas and moving further out to the suburbs and the exurbs. But uh, a lot of that movement has really already been done. This graph here looks at the temporary moves from USPS data um, for the last couple of years. And we can see that that yellow dotted line on the left hand side was uh, the beginning of the pandemic. We had a lot of temporary moves. We had a lot of people moving, um, but they weren't moving permanently. 
and that kind of stopped, right? In 2021, we've seen much less um, temporary moves and, and, and more back on, on more of a normal trend. We also know that permanent moves are done. So we have, you know, a lot of uh, remote work that, that influenced a lot of these digital nomads and moves that were happening in the past two years are pretty much over with um, for the most part. And so we're not going to see those trends as strong as we come into 2022. The bigger story in terms of the workplace is going to be coming out of the great resignation. We've had a lot of people quitting their jobs in the past couple of months, more than we've ever seen in this country, and that's really going to shape a lot of housing markets, especially when we look at that in, in relation to the retirement boom. This chart is an age distribution of the United States that looks at um, where our population is aging. The boomers, which is that bright blue on the left-hand side, um, it shows us that there's, there's a really big population that's going to be retiring soon. In 2022, we can just shift this graph two years over and we'll see that big spike is going to be turning 20, or 62 in the next in the next year and that's a, a really peak age for retirees. We also know from the Great Resignation a lot of people are quitting their jobs and they're going to be retiring early and what that means is we're going to have a lot of, of retirees that are really going to be influencing what housing markets are going to have a lot of demand. Um, we look here at the share of, of buyers in different markets that are over age 60 so the darker blue are places where you know we have more of these baby boomer these older generations transacting and that's again in that inland west and sunbelt we're going to see elevated levels of demand in this region as a result of this retirement boom you know that's going to put a lot of challenges on uh, particularly younger millennial first-time buyers in these markets as we have a lot of these retirees who were likely already homeowners they're taking the equity uh, that they have from their their home that they've owned for 30 years and they're coming in as cash buyers in these markets you know it's going to be a really competitive market already and to have all of these cash buyers coming in is going to put a lot more competition and a lot more pressure onto first-time buyers in a lot of these markets and so that's going to be a concern um, coming into next year as well. But not everybody is going to be buying a house and moving. As I mentioned previously, permanent, permanent moves were down in the last year. The share of Americans that has moved, it has decreased um, every year for the past couple of decades, right? We don't have as many people moving as used to move. Um, and so, uh, but, but a lot of the challenges that faced all of us were facing people who weren't moving as well. And what that led to, you know, this, this rise of remote work and homeschooling and all of these other th factors from the pandemic um, that left a lot of us at home for, for much of the last couple of years um, is leading to this renovation boom. You know, we're seeing a lot of people renovating their homes. Um, and, and this graph here is the, the amount of um, total amount of consumer spending on a renovation of remodeling projects. And that's increasing and it's projected to increase into 2022 as well. So, you know, we're going to see um, a really high share of people transacting in these, uh, these uh, renovation projects. Zillow's survey shows that around three quarters of homeowners are looking to um, do some sort of remodel or renovation project in the next year and here are some of the top projects right bathroom and kitchen hit the top of the list and I don't know if any of you have tried to remodel your bathroom and your kitchen but those are really expensive projects um, and so we're going to see some things coming in 2022 of how people are going to be financing those projects um, and then one big thing that that has come out of you know the last year and a half has really been refinances right this these charts here look at the share of overall home mortgage applications that come from different sectors the light blue on the left is um, refinance applications and we can see, you know, in 2020, we had a huge number of refinances happening. We had a lot of people, you know, taking advantage of low interest rates and whatever, whatever. Um, and as we heard earlier from the Mortgage Bankers Association is the people who have refinanced for rate term, have, they've already done it, right? We don't see as many of these happening in 2021. What's going to come in 2022 um, is cash out refinances as a way to fund a lot of these home improvement projects, right? We're going to have these people with a lot of equity in their home and they're going to be looking for ways to tap into that equity. And so we're going to see elevated levels of home uh, of cash out refinances as people are looking for ways to really make their homes work for them. One of the big reasons why so many people are trying to make their homes work for them rather than going out and buying a new one is that supply, as I mentioned earlier, has been extremely low in this last year. Demand for single family homes has been extremely high in the beginning of the pandemic. People were looking for more space, outdoor space, bigger kitchens, whatever it was, and they were looking for that in single family homes. And so 
so that's where we saw the, the biggest demand and the biggest drop in inventory. Some somewhat good news is we've started to see single family inventory increasing a little bit over the past couple of months. Um, and, and a lot of that has to do with new construction. We've seen um, in, in 2021 more homes under construction any year since before the Great Recession, um, which is a really huge thing. You know, that's been a big problem and that's why supply is so low is because construction was down so much. Um, the backlog of single family homes is lower than the backlog of overall homes. And so we don't have as much to catch up on and things are getting better. And so that's definitely good news for the market that's really starved of inventory and looking for more single family homes. But the problem is that, that we're not just looking at single family homes in terms of a for sale market anymore. We're going to start to see a lot more demand for single family homes in the rental market. This looks at a different sort of age distribution by, by the number of uh, renter households in both single family and multifamily homes. And we can see that older renters are more likely to be in single family homes. One thing we're expecting to start to see in the next year, a trend that's going to start in 2020 is that renters are going to start to get older and stay in the rental market for much longer. As they get older, we're going to start to see a higher demand for single family homes as that's what these older renters are demanding. You know, they're starting to have kids, raise their families, and they're looking for more space to do that. And so we're going to have a demand for much larger rentals, particularly in the single family uh, market. Some of the reasons why we're expecting that renters are going to stay in the rental market for longer is that there have been a lot of challenges that hit renters during the pandemic. We know that renters are more likely to be impacted by a pandemic-induced job loss and just be more impacted overall financially. And we've also seen a lot of variability in the rental market. You know, in the beginning of the pandemic, we had a lot of rents stalling or dropping, and we thought, ah, oh, maybe this is good for renters. We found out that it wasn't really that great for, you know, particularly low-income renters didn't really get that reprieve um, in rent prices. And, and rents have really increased a lot over the past couple of months since this summer. This graph here shows that in July, we saw rents passing the pre where we think rents would have been had they followed pre-pandemic trends. That's that yellow line. Um, and, and rents have passed over that in July and have only continued to grow. You know, 9.2% annual growth in July seemed like a lot, but now we're talking about 14% annual growth in rent prices. And so things are getting really, really expensive really fast for renters, and that's putting a lot of um, renters in, in kind of a sticky situation. And that's really happening all over the country. You know, we're seeing rent prices increasing really, really fast um, in, in all sorts of markets. And what that's doing is that's really deteriorating rent affordability. Again, affordability we talk about is the share of income spent on housing. So this is the share of income spent on rents. And nationally, we've already passed over that 30% threshold that I mentioned, you know, that, that the majority of renters in this country are housing burdened. Um, and that number is going to continue to increase. We're going to continue to see challenges in rent affordability. And that's putting a lot of pressure on um, renters' budgets, you know, how much they have left over for things like saving for a down payment. If you want to move from being a renter to being a homeowner, you know, you have to have that down payment to fund that. Um, and as renters are spending so much more of their income on, on, on rent, um, we're going to see um, that becoming much more of a challenge moving forward. We have markets like Las Vegas that have just seen rents going through the roof um, and, and we're seeing affordability taking a serious hit. You know, for a market that typically has had affordability under 30% to be up towards 30%, 37% next year is going to be a huge challenge for renters to be able to, to find a way to, to make that work. And, and we're going to see a lot of um, issues coming out of that in terms of affordability um, and what the, the you know, housing crisis is going to look like for renters in cities like, in cities like Las Vegas. We do have places where rents are, you know, actually doing okay and renters are faring all right, where incomes are growing a lot faster than, than rents are. Um, cities like Cleveland and other Midwest areas are really seeing, you know, affordability is getting better. So there are places where renters are doing all right and, you know, the, the story isn't so bad for them. But we still come back to this idea that, you know, even if rents in the whole country dropped and then renter affordability started getting better, renters are still facing this huge uh, issue with the down payment. That's really the biggest barrier when it comes comes to um, moving towards uh, becoming a homeowner is this down payment. This graph here looks at the years it takes to save for a down payment on a starter home in different markets in the United States for renters based on renter incomes. Um, and this is a 10% down payment. Um, the national renter saving rate, savings rate is only 2.4%, which is low, but that's the realistic number. That's what most renters are looking at. 
And, and I just want to call out the fact that, you know, these are years it takes to save. In San Diego, it takes renters 36 years of their current income to save for a down payment on a starter home house. That's not even the median house. That's the cheap houses. And so, you know, uh, this is a huge problem that's facing, you know, a lot of people. And, and many renters are kind of coming to, to understand that it's just becoming such a, a difficult process that they're kind of counting themselves out, right? So we're, we're seeing a lot of um, uh, a lot of people who just really are, are never going to be able to uh, to afford a, a home because they can't afford a down payment. Um, and so, you know, this research was done in March. Uh, home prices have increased a lot since then. Um, and this number has also increased a lot since then. You know, it's taking, this is a moving target as home prices increase a lot faster than renter incomes. We're going to start to see this becoming more and more of a challenge um, moving forward. We know that renters are, are becoming more conscious and wanting to buy a home. We see a lot more people who are, who are really thinking more forward about their long-term housing goals. Our survey data shows us in the yellow that there are more renters who are considering buying a home. The blue shows us the share of first-time buyers. So there's more people who want to buy a home, but it's becoming so much more of a challenge. And a lot of that has to do with the down payment issue. Um, you know, one. One maybe silver lining that has come out of the pandemic is for renters who were able to save um, money as they, were st as they stayed employed during the pandemic, 60% or so of them said that they would use that money towards a down payment. So we have a lot of these uh, millennial and Gen Z renters who are really forward thinking in terms of what they want in housing. They know they want to buy a house. They're trying to save money for it. Um, you know, they're much more likely to be using tech tools and then using Zillow surfing to really find out like what, what type of house they want. And we have a lot of these these, you know, younger generations that are really uh, wanting to buy a house, but they're just not going to be able to get there. We come back to this chart and we can focus on the yellow in the middle. Um, this is the millennial population and we can see that uh, as we approach 2022, the millennial population is starting to age into that uh, median age of a first-time buyer, which is at 36, that arrow, um, at age 36 there. And we have all of these people who should essentially be buying their first home, but they're faced with things like increasing home prices, which mean increasing down payment, which is just unattainable for most renters, really high rent burdens that are eating up their budgets, um, mortgage rates that are going to be increasing and really playing into this affordability challenge, facing a lot more competition from retirees and boomers who have a lot of cash and are able to outbid them. And they're facing all of these things all at once. And, and that's really putting a lot of uh, um, you know, negative pressure on these, on these millennial uh, uh, and, and Gen Z generations, and they're not going to be able to afford to buy a house. And so they're going to stay in the rental market. And we're going to start to see, again, that, that increase in demand for single family rentals. And this is really why we're going to see that is because it's it's not really possible for a lot of people to buy a home. You know, that kind of brings up the question of build to rent models. You know, is that the solution to this problem? I'm not going to get into whether I think that's the solution or not, but that's definitely going to become a topic of conversation more throughout the next year as we see all of these renters demanding single family homes, but uh, not being able to afford to buy one. And so um, with that, um, that's just all to say, it's been a really crazy year in housing. A lot of stuff has happened. A lot of stuff is going to happen next year that we don't even know about yet. Um, but Zillow is going to be here. You know, We have a team of great economists who do a lot of really good research and have a lot of data. We have our PR team that loves setting up interviews and being able to help you guys talk to your markets and your consumers on what's happening in real estate and housing. And so um, you, know, you can reach out to us either this week at NARI or you can reach out to us at press at zillowgroup.com um, with any media inquiries and we can help you guys um, get the data together that you need. So thank you.